Hello, it's Mr. Cherk. Um, I don't have a really good name for this uh, project here, so I'm just going to call it a large-scale collaborative painting, even though uh, the scale is kind of variable and the collaborative nature of it is kind of optional. Um, essentially what I want you to do, or, or what I'm going to force you to do, is make a canvas or paint on a canvas that's at least larger than two feet in both or either directions. and um, uh, the canvases we do have in the canvas boards we do have in the closet are at least two feet in one direction I believe but uh, I want you to paint on something larger than that so obviously before you start anything you, and before committing that much uh, time and resource your faculties all into that big kind of project I want you to have I want you to have a detailed color sketch before you start um, this is a must if I'm going to commit you know, serious resources to your idea. Um, you're also going to have the option of, you know, picking kind of where and more what you want to do and what you want to do it on. So, like, uh, I will have wood available for making large canvases. You can also, if you want, paint on a ceiling tile or two or one of the cabinet doors, provided that you prep that surface properly. So, if you um, sand and prime it and then seal it when you're done, that's all good and you can do that. Um, I'm going to allow you, if you want, to work in a group of two. Uh, you, you don't have to, uh, although I highly recommend it. it. It helps you cover the surface and it, it's kind of fun to work with the partner. You, you can share some of the responsibilities and, and maybe you make, you know, maybe a cooler idea when you work with somebody else. Um, it can also be kind of frustrating because most artists are pretty introverted and, and alone so I can understand that and I, I'm not going to force you to work with the group but I highly recommend it. Um, when, if you're going to paint on a uh, wood surface like a cabinet I'm going to force you to use acrylic paint. Uh, you don't have an option as to which paint you use. That's the only kind of paint that's going to sustain the wear and tear of those surfaces. Um, your subject matter can be anything. It's completely open. But like I said at the start, you're going to have to make a very detailed color sketch before commencing with your work. And part of that, uh, part of that process is I want to know exactly what you're doing. It has to be school appropriate. It has to be acceptable to pretty much anybody who's going to look at it. Uh, this is a school environment, so you can't paint you know your religious views because uh, that's kind of not fair to you know somebody who doesn't share those same views you can't paint certain topics that are offensive to other cultures or put other people down uh, and I don't want your painting to be interpreted as anything offensive or I don't want it to have any uh, sexual innuendo or kind of anything that you know could irk somebody because it it's a classroom that I have to share with a lot of different students and a lot of different viewpoints and if somebody's offended by it then I can't you know learn it's not a safe environment for them so you know even if it's something as harmless or seemingly in a inoffensive to you I mean I'm, I'm gonna play it safe with this and I want you to play it safe as well so make sure you're thinking of that when you make your sketch um, I will also say this uh, your artwork may not be permanent uh, I have a limited number of ceiling tiles and cabinets to paint on and if I'm gonna continue to do this here or continue to do it in the future I may select works that have been around a while or just you know weren't as strong when they were executed to be painted over or you know summarily censored if there's a problem later on um, this isn't necessarily a bad thing I don't think I mean I've made quite a few works that are just kind of rolling up rolled up and sitting in my garage that nobody's seen for years I, I also know that I made some work that was just more or less performance based that you know once it was made it just sort of disappeared so it's kinda it kinda comes par for the course. I mean, think of this as like practice and less like a masterpiece for the end of all time. Uh, so yeah, uh, the main objective of this, of, of course, is to get you out of your box, your little sort of traditional way of thinking about how art is made and how, you know, like things like scale or the idea that you have to make it alone. Uh, art for many, 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 many years has not been made uh, with just one master sitting alone in the studio. Uh, it's It's got a rich tradition of, of collaborative uh, uh, collaborative nature. So I'm going to get into that in the next couple slides. 
Um, this is by far uh, not a comprehensive list of the kinds of large-scale paintings. In fact, I'm pretty sure if my art history professor saw this, they'd be kind of ashamed. But teach in high school, and these are kind of summaries of like the, the kinds of large-scale work that is collaborative or massive in nature, and just sort of its nature. Um, at the beginning, you had uh, the traditional studio setup. So there was a master, and he had apprentices. And the apprentices would basically be the guys who like, all right, I got to paint this sky blue paint the sky blue or I gotta prep this fresco so put the plaster on there and mix that up and they, they were kinda you know they would help make the painting but you know they were kinda the painting the least important parts you know they, they weren't as important as the master the master would paint like the main figures or the main scene he would do the composition and all that uh, speaking of frescoes fresco painting is um, traditionally what is thought of as the first kinda large-scale painting style in my mind that I know uh, frescoes are painted into wet plaster, so when they dry, they become part of the wall. And they're often commissioned in, uh, you know, medieval Europe all around uh, as decorations for, you know, state and church offices, um, and were often extremely large in scale. We'll take a look at them, a couple of them in the next couple slides here. And then, you know, mur murals often are done with groups of artists. Uh, you know what a mural is? It's a large-scale painting on, you know, a building or a wall. There's tons of those around. Uh, street art can sometimes can be considered a large-scale painting style. Often graffiti, especially when it's done well, is just massive. And uh, yeah, you've probably seen quite a few examples of those, so I probably won't show you too much of that. History paintings, uh, you probably don't know much about. Uh, back in the olden days when there was a hierarchy of genres, like you had paintings that were super important and paintings that were the least important. Uh, an example of the least important kind of paintings would be stuff like still lives. I mean, they just weren't as impressive or large. Uh, history paintings, on the other hand, would depict mythology or famous events in history or um, just there would be these massive canvases depicting these scenes and often these were the largest and most impressive works. Like an artist, if they made a history painting, they were they were shooting for fame. Um, and then in the contemporary times, like the, now, uh, there's just, you know, there's artist collectives, which I won't get into. There's, there's still the apprenticeship system, kind of. And then, you know, there's just painters who paint collaboratively. Like there's pairs of painters who work together or there's, you know, just all sorts of setups where, you know, painters may do this part of the painting and then hand it off to somebody else to finish the other. Um, and some of that is craft and some of it's considered fine art. So I'm going to kind of walk you through all these examples here and just sort of get inspired or get excited about what it is you want to do as you're kind of soaking in some of the history here. Um, again, one of your options is to paint a ceiling tile or a cabinet door. Um, I have an awful lot of unpainted surfaces in my room, and these two panorama shots just give you kind of an, uh, a breadth of, of places to paint. Obviously, these cabinets, I mean, I don't care if you paint the lower portions, we could probably take those black things off and paint the entire door there. I have tons of ceiling tiles on both sides of the room that I'm completely cool with you guys painting. A couple of the tables probably could be sanded and painted, and then there's, of course, the stools. Uh, they're, they're not large enough to really be considered uh, something you could paint for this, but if you want to, you can paint some of the rectangular ones or you can paint uh, several of the round stools if you have a really, really good proposal. So just, just kind of talk to me. Any wooden surface really is fair game, so long as you prep it and uh, have a plan for it. Um, again, you have the option to paint as a group, a pair. And the reason I'm limiting it to a pair is because this is kind of early on in this project. I haven't taught it very many times, and, and my experience has been with a group of three or larger that often uh, there's at least one person in the group of three that just isn't doing enough. Uh, the scales we're probably going to get to in terms of size it isn't, just isn't going to allow for three people, really. I mean, we're not doing a massive wall size mural. Uh, where obviously you could easily fit three people in there and they would have plenty to do. We're going to do something akin to more of this size, which kind of limits it to about two people. All right, so 
Um, I've actually been to Europe, and uh, this is Church of Saint Ignacio de Loyola. Uh, he's the founder, I believe, of the Jesuits, or an important Jesuit, I can't remember. Anywho, uh, this fresco is on the ceiling of that church. It was done by Andrea Pozo, and this is just a beautiful church to be in. I've actually been here. It's a fantastic use of trompe l'oeil, which is French for trick the eye. And it kind of makes it look as if the heavens are opening above the actual physical church itself. And again, this is a painting. This is a fresco on the ceiling of a church. It's an extremely impressive, uh, masterful Baroque uh, work. And uh, if you do decide to paint a ceiling tile, oh, this will kind of be something cool to try. But again, a great example of just a really lively fresco. Of course, the most famous fresco of them all, probably, uh, is the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. And I, I could go into the history here and all the symbology and stuff, but basically he depicts, like, the entire Bible. And the back and front are, I believe, uh, the Ascension and uh, Jesus judging all of the uh, people as they ascend to heaven. Uh, I'm trying to remember everything I learned about this from art history. It's but uh, I can't really recall all of it. And I could bore you to death with it, but there's just tons of information about this. Something else to look forward to, though, and, and something that's kind of also inspiring about this is just the different formats and sizes he uses for this. Like, uh, the altarpiece is a very weird shape, and then he's got these triangles. And, you know, don't feel limited to just doing one ceiling tile. You can do multiple ones. The way this kind of panels at the top here you know, is a thing to think about when you're doing your ceiling tile. You can do it that way. Um, if you've ever been to the Louvre, I've been, uh, they display paintings in the traditional style. These are some examples of just the scale of a traditional history painting. Uh, you can obviously see the Delacroix on the left, and then there's the Raft of the Medusa on the right here, and, you know, with some people for scale, these paintings are just absolutely massive, and the Louvre has just and they have the great hall and then they have several side halls with just just tons of these paintings just towering over you and then you know you can go into the back galleries and there's quite a few artists who just they have like a whole room of this and that uh, artists with just massive works hanging on them uh, if you ever get a chance to go to a museum go to museums and sort of soak this in I mean chances are you know you'll appreciate them more when you've actually made one uh, today, uh, typical murals are considered to be sort of decoration. Um, you, you do actually see some mural artists. Uh, this guy down here on the left, obviously, you know, like, you think to yourself, well, I'm never going to be a famous artist. But, you know, there are other jobs that involve painting in a fine arts uh, capacity, and mural painting is one of those. Um, these artists do get hired to paint in people's homes. Uh, often they're pretty skilled and do kind of truffle oil effects or trick the eye effects. Um, sometimes they'll paint uh, public spaces. I, I kind of want you to shy away from this, although you can try it if you want. I, I don't. I don't mind so long as your proposal is is well made and you have the skill. You can you can try this, but uh, you know don't don't be too cutesy with it. That's, that's kind of simple, and it kind of leaves it sort of vacant on purpose so that it's not as distracting. And I want you to make a painting, like something eye-catching and commanding. Um, so, let's uh, skip forward a couple of centuries, obviously. Um, I could go on and on and on about art and history in collaboration, but, you know, I'm not too studied up on it, and I, I really don't want to make the definitive history lecture on collaboration in art. So I'm just going to pick and choose a couple examples to sort of explain to you how important this is and what it can do and what it means. Um, this is just kind of a mind-blowing example of collaboration. Uh, Jeff Johns and Robert, Robert Rauschenberg were part of the 60s pop art, pop art movement and they started to kind of redefine what could potentially be art. So one of their most famous collaborative pieces was this. Uh, and it's a, a raced drawing that was originally done by William Willem de Kooning and uh, he became kind of a famous abstract expressionist artist and when these guys were getting famous at the time they just basically said well let's re redefine what it means to make art like by destroying art so they asked de Kooning hey can we take one of your drawings and erase it and he agreed reluctantly and 
that's exactly what they did. They just erased the drawing and then framed it and just sort of said, you know what, this is art. The destructive process, the, the process of not creating is art. So um, it kind of brings up all sorts of associations and it was really radical at the time. So just, you know, obviously I don't want you to do something this minimalistic, but it's still kind of cool to think about being that daring or being that uh, open-minded about what could potentially be an object. Uh, another great example of collaborative work in the modern era would be Andy Warhol's factory. Um, I could go on and on about Warhol. He's, he's extremely famous for his uh, screen prints and what, but um, he's most noted for the fact that he barely made some of the works that he created. Like, he had this factory. And in the 60s and 70s, I believe, in New York, uh, you, you could basically walk into the factory and if you needed a job or you just liked art and liked Andy, you could get a job making art for Andy in his factory. And so the picture on the right down here, you can see two guys just sort of holding uh, paintings of his. And, you know, he would have came up with the idea, but like uh, the whole process of making the art would have been the job of his factory workers. And, you know, that's just kind of how he made his made his art and made his money. I mean, it, it, it kind of called back to that old medieval tradition of like the apprenticeship program where, you know, there was the master and then you had the apprentices making some of the work for the master. Kind of the same thing, except now he was using these commodified images, these really cheap kind of poppy images to, to sort of, you know, celebrate consumerism. And so the fact that he wasn't making it was kind of like a factory, uh, you know, a, a can of Campbell's soup isn't actually made by Joseph Campbell. It's made by, you know, farmers farming the materials and then a factory worker assembling them into the can of soup. It wasn't, you know, just one guy making it. So that, that that's kind of the power of collaboration. You know, you can you can make an awful lot more. You can you can make it uh, for everybody and you can make it better sometimes or, you know, just sort of redefine the object in the process. Uh, one of his other favorite and famous ca collaborations was uh, with uh, Jean Michael uh, Basquiat. I never know how to pronounce that. Uh, and Basquiat was a painter in the traditional sense. And they collaborated for a series of paintings. I was kind of decried at the time, but, you know, they sort of shared a lot of concerns. And Basquiat looked up to Warhol in many ways. But this is just kind of an example of, like, how you could mesh two styles. These are really... Two really just uh, um, synchronous styles, bright colors, uh, you know, their own visual language. And so, you know, if you look at Warhol's and you look at Basquiat's, the collaboration sort of makes sense. Like, you can see bits and pieces of both of them in the painting. So look this up if you kind of want to see an idea of, like, like what it means to combine two different styles. Um, the reason I mention Pollock right now is uh, he kind of added the physicality to large-scale works that just wasn't present up until that point. Like, the actual gesture of tossing paint needed that large scale for it to work. Um, and I think he started that when he, when he did this work called Mural. He was given this large canvas by, I believe, an art dealer or somebody, a friend of his, and told, all right, you, you got to paint this, or I commissioned you to paint this, and I think he procrastinated until the last second and only painted it in, like, two, three days. But uh, it just marked a, a big departure from his original style. And it just has these huge gestural strokes in it. Um, I want you to think about that physicality in your work. You know, now that you have all this space, you can do some really big arm motions. And you can really punch and pull the paint in a way you can't do when you're working in a small setting with, you know, small wrist and finger movements. Uh, another large-scale artist around this time, a color field painter, the genesis of color field painting, was uh, Mark Rothko. Uh, his works are massive fields of color, and they're meant to be experienced as such. In fact, I think he recommended that you stand about two inches away from the painting so that it just envelops your vision and you're consumed by his uh, choices. Um, another collaborative work of his was this chapel, uh, or known as Rothko Chapel. He painted these massive just pitch black paintings and the chapel is is a religious like anybody of any religion can come in and just sort of meditate and just be consumed by these works 
And it's just, you know, it's a great melding of, of painting and architecture. And not so much murals and not so much finished works without the context. And it's just a, a thing to think about. Like, how does your work create presence? Uh, how should it be experienced? Like, what kind of impact is it going to have? Solo Wit, another minimalist artist, loves large scale. He does massive works. But he's kind of interesting in a small way because he's very collaborative. I don't think he ever really does participate in the works. Like, he has an idea and commissions people to paint them. And he uses these giant geometric abstraction uh, works, and they're just, there's fabulous colors in them and lots of movement, and, you know, they're, they're usually installed and then taken down, and you just sort of experience them as such, as uh, pure joy, pure color. Um, so these are great works to look at and just enjoyable to, I believe, probably make. Uh, <laughs> never actually painted murals for this long or of this scale. And they're so precise. Um, you can be precise as well as, you know, kind of loose like the previous two artists. Another thing to note about Solo Wit, again, he didn't really make his works, he gave instructions for them. One of his more famous sets of instruction works are not really his paintings, but his scribbles. Uh, the one in the lower left-hand corner, the instructions is right here in the, in the middle, and basically had, you know, 20 different line types, and then they had to be arranged in like a sequential order, and overlap in a certain way and so you know based on that set of instructions you would get this installation down here uh, where all the line types sort of combined and connected in weird ways and so he would just kind of let that happen to see what would happen from it you know he had it all planned out and then you know people executed it for him and the same thing with the scribble drawings I think you can see it in the upper left hand corner here that's the kind of marks he would use to make this on the right hand side and these works, if you look at them up close again, look like scribbles, but they just are these massive gradients. Really, really kind of cool, minimal uh, drawings. Um, you can kind of think in this way, too. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to make large strokes. You can make tiny strokes to make a large impact as well. You can kind of incorporate drawing into your painting, or you can incorporate a, a single process into the painting to kind of create some kind of texture or weird surface. Um, now we're into, you know, living artists. Uh, the Clayton brothers are, again, just, I believe, two maternal, yeah, two brothers, and they, uh, if I, I'm, I'm probably not right on that, you'll have to look it up. But they, they work and paint together on one canvas. And uh, they don't necessarily work at the same time, but one will start painting on it, and then the other will take his turn, and they'll just sort of layer and layer and layer until they wind up with these huge canvases of like these really bright, colorful, trippy paintings. Um, I want you to kind of look at their work as sort of the potential for collaboration. Like, it doesn't have to be tame. Like, these guys make an absolute mess of their work. Like, there is just so many colors and so many shapes going on. I really like their work. I actually saw a show of theirs at, uh, in, uh, Madison's Contemporary Museum of Art. And it was a, it was a great little show. Um, their work is really, really energetic and, you know, just... You can tell it's collaborative. You can see all the different shapes and the different layers. I mean, of course, one guy probably could have done this, but I think the spontaneity and the, the chaos of it comes from having two minds working on one thing. Uh, Dabs and Myla, or Dabs and Mylar, as they're sometimes called, uh, are, I believe, a husband and wife pair of artists. I'm not sure. But uh, they work in that kind of contemporary pop surrealist style and they do graffiti and they do uh, fine artworks as well. So there's a couple pictures of them with their graffiti around them. Here's some of their graffiti. There's a lot of this. I'll look it up on the web. It's pretty cool stuff. Very cartoony. And then here's some of their fine artworks. Um, again, these are these are kind of small scale, but you know, obviously they do large scale works together as well. And you know, another example of just the power of collaboration and how that can work to make some really interesting work. Uh, I, I don't know why they combine buildings and cartoon characters. I think I have an interview of theirs in a juxtapose somewhere on my somewhere on my bookshelf. So um, yeah, look into these guys if you're kind of interested in how collaboration work. Uh, there is no demonstration, obviously. Um, I can help you with the prepping process, but again, you need a full color detailed sketch of your idea. It has to be school appropriate and, and more than one. And uh, you can start painting whenever you're ready 
and prepped to go.